Welcome guys, uh, I'm so glad you could be here for professional development. Uh, what we're going to do today is this is going to be AP government simulations now. I'm so glad I have some of the other AP government teachers here and so we can kind of compare and contrast the way we do things. Now, also I'm so glad we have some of our English teachers here, we have some of our science teachers here, where you guys can use sort of some of these tools as well to run perhaps a different simulation within your room. Now, let me kind of explain as to just one simulation that we do. We do all sorts of different simulations in AP government. We do mock uh, uh, trials, we do mock Senate uh, proceedings, we do all sorts of things. But the one that perhaps is the most interesting for my kids, I know, is when we get into actual court cases. There are a few reasons why this is so valuable. First off, it gives students an opportunity to actually be a part of the Supreme Court. Before we do these, we have to go through all the steps of what it takes to actually get a Supreme Court ruling, and we explain kind of parliamentary procedure and just all, everything that has to take place. It's hard for my teenagers to grasp sort of the power and the influence they have. So in order to really get them in the mindset of what it takes, this really puts them in the shoes of being a Supreme Court justice. And really, this is the first time they kind of have an opportunity to see really how it works. So each student is going to be a Supreme Court justice. Also, this really does give them an opportunity to form their own opinion and also defend that opinion. Now, you'll see in a moment that I'm gonna give them facts of the case and they need to take those facts to develop what they believe and then defend it. So many times within some of our other simulations, my students will say something and have no way to defend it. So giving them the facts is going to be something that's imperative for this. Also, they simply need to know some of these cases for their AP exam. This happens to be one that we're gonna cover in a little bit that is often tested, so they need to be certain that they are very familiar with this. The first case that we are gonna talk about is one that pertains very specifically to my high school juniors. This is New Jersey versus TLO. Now, in this case, this takes place in 1984, and the facts are as follows. Now, I will tell you this. I give my students the facts, but somewhat boil this down as well, just to give them highlights. Because if you give all of this to them, sometimes they get caught up in sort of the minutia, and if you boil it down, sometimes it leaves more room for interpretation. But this is going to be really uh, the overall facts. What this is, TLO is a 14-year-old female student in New Jersey High School. A teacher found TLO and another student smoking cigarettes in the girls' restroom in the school building in violation of school rules. The teacher brought the two students to a school administrator who questioned each of them. TLO denied the allegations. The administrator demanded to see her purse in an attempt to find the cigarettes. When the administrator opened her purse, he found a pack of cigarettes and continued the search yielding a bag of marijuana and other drug paraphernalia. The administrator contacted the police who in turn contacted TLO's mother. Her mother brought TLO to the police station where she confessed to selling marijuana. Now on the handout that I gave you guys, this is the same handout that I give my kids. The first step is they need to really say, well, with these facts, how does this apply to civil liberties? How does this apply to your own protections? So the big question is, and I always highlight this with my kids, it's not the girl that's on trial. She's already had her trial. It's the Constitution that's on trial. For this instance, the big question is, did this search violate the Fourth Amendment? Now is when things get to be a little bit more difficult for them as I give them the actual language from the Fourth Amendment, and then we're gonna talk about really what this means. The language is, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects, against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. On your page, you'll see this as well. What does the Fourth Amendment really mean? Now, I have my kids write down in their own words what they think it means. Now, being that we are a bit short on time today, I want to just ask you guys first, how would you just kind of explain what this means? What does the Fourth Amendment say? Or maybe even specific pieces that you might need to highlight for your kids. What would you think about this? Heather, what do you think? Um, just, we always just refer to it just as unreasonable search and seizure. Okay, mm -hmm. sure. Okay, absolutely, and that's a great place to start. 
Now we get to a point where we say, well, what's considered to be unreasonable? Perhaps one person believes it's very reasonable and one does not. So when, this, when we get to the idea of unreasonable, I always pause and highlight this. Now there's something else in this particular case that makes it a little different from others. Is this still the same even though it's in school? Now, at this point, we talk about how do you think the Supreme Court ruled? Now again, on your page you have the same thing that I give my kids. You have a line down there that says, how do you think the Supreme Court ruled? Again, I have them write down, do you think this violated her rights or did it not? With a brief explanation. Now. I know some of you AP government teachers already know what happens, so I'm gonna ask you not to spoil the surprise. <laughs> Show of hands, who says that yes, this was a violation of her rights? Okay, who says no, this was not a violation, this search was okay? Some of you are still formulating, okay? Now here's the thing, I'm gonna ask you guys, just like I do my kids, why are you correct? Now, I usually split up my kids and say, if you believe this is a violation, you sit over here. If you believe no, you sit over here. And then we start the discussion. So let me ask you guys, why are you right? Why was this a violation of her rights? Or why was it not? Lenore, what do you think? I like, uh, going back to the Fourth Amendment, I probable cause. I feel like there was substantial probable cause here, and whatever was revealed as a result of that was revealed and can't not be controlled. But Excellent. I'm so glad you brought that up, too. Lenore, what about this specifically from the facts which you say was the probable cause? What would you say is just that moment where you said, yes, now that search is okay? I was smoking in the bathroom. That's it. <laughs> Absolutely. At school. I was smoking in the bathroom at school. It's a direct violation of school rules. Excellent. So a great place to start is, yes, she was caught all but red-handed smoking in the bathroom. Now let me ask you guys as well. Does that amount of fact, that evidence, constitute a search of her purse, her car, her locker, everything? Or is it just one particular area? What do you think? Dina, what were you saying earlier about how, where does this search go awry, maybe? Well, it's the principal that did the search, right? Uh, yes. For so the school did? Yes. The school did the search. But the Fourth Amendment, wouldn't it be, I mean, like, inside the school they have this power, outside they don't have this power, and it's, oh, what was I thinking? It was, uh, darn it, I've lost it. Are you kind of suggesting the idea of yeah, they this? Don't, it's too far. Like you're giving this one individual or this entity this power to search anybody for anything when she wasn't caught. I mean, there was what smoke in the bathroom. Yes. Did anyone see her? Not necessarily. Could there have been somebody else in there before her? There was. Are you suggesting this is too much power for one person? Yeah, I think so. Does this kind of go beyond just the powers of a principal? Does this person take on a role of almost? an absolute monarch while they're in school and a common citizen as soon as they leave. Yeah, it gives them all that power within the building, but then they're just a regular old Joe. I mean, they just have, I mean, yeah, I can't start a student. Okay. Let me ask some of our English teachers. What did you guys think about this? Does this give too much power? Does it violate this person's rights? What were you guys thinking just initially? Keith, what do you think? I think it was too much power because, again, we don't know if she was really smoking or not, so we're just going to assume and start looking through everything. I okay. think that's too much. And this is something that comes, and this is great to do with high school students as well because you say, well, are the rules different if you're in school versus being in society? This is something that they will always wrestle with, and especially my teenagers will always say there's too much power in school. Now guys, I do want to honor your time, so thank you very much for coming today. I appreciate it. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me, and have a good day.